Welcome back, everybody. Hope everyone had a good Memorial Day today. Um, I didn't do much. Just I'm upstate and just hung out with my daughter. We just dropped her off earlier tonight back with her mom and just grilled some food. And that was basically it. So hopefully you had a more exciting Memorial Day. Now, this is a horror channel in its infancy. And I'm going to do something a little out of the ordinary and unorthodox by reviewing this film. And we are talking about Darren Aronofsky's 2000 masterpiece, Requiem for a Dream. Now, like I said, it's a horror channel. This is more of a drama, psychological thriller is what it's billed as, but to me and to many others that I've talked to and friends of mine, this is a fucking horror movie through and through. If you can't watch this movie, if you watch this movie and you see everything that these characters go through and find it terrifying and depressing as shit and just horrific in every way and you can't look at this and call this a horror film or at least a whole bunch of horror elements in this no I mean, the answer is no like <laughs> you you can't like this is horror to a degree and to enough of a degree that I felt it was deserved to be talked about. This is a favorite film of mine. One of those type of favorite films that I cannot watch that often because it's just depressing as shit. And it sticks with you long after the movie ends. And just let's dive into it. So we have Jared Leto. We have Ellen Burstyn, who is phenomenal in everything she's in. She's one of my favorite actresses. We have Jennifer Connelly, who is absolutely gorgeous. And I mean, since she was in Argento's Phenomena, I um, absolutely loved her. Always loved uh, Jennifer Connelly. And then we have Marlon Wayans in a role that is was not expected of him at the time in 2000. He was always for the Wayne's brothers and their comedy and stuff like that. Very different role for Wayne's here that he never really did before. And he does a great job. Like every, all four of the main characters in this film do absolutely amazing performances. And especially Ellen Burstyn. Like, the fact that she didn't win the Academy Award for this film is a fucking travesty. She was nominated. I forget who beat her or what movie it was, but whatever it was, I guarantee it fucking sucked compared to her performance in this movie. It's, it's fucking, it's iconic, her performance in this. It is so phenomenal that it's, it blows my mind every time I see this movie. Just seeing her act the way she does as Sarah Goldfarb, I don't even know how to describe it or how, like what to say about it besides just saying how brilliant she is in this film. It's unreal. And Jared Leto does a phenomenal job too. I read actually that he actually, to prepare, to prepare for this role, he lived on the streets for like weeks or months at a time and like hung out around junkies and stuff like that to be around them and see how they lived. And he actually starved himself for a few weeks or a month or something like that to lose a lot of weight to really get that like drug addict junkie look to him good method acting man i mean that takes a lot to be living on the streets like that so i can't believe ellen burston's 89 years old right now like that i knew she was getting up there i mean exorcist was what 73 so we're talking 30, 50 years ago plus but 
did not think she was 89 years old until like, I looked that up and I said, she's fucking 89 now? Like, unbelievable. And she looks great. She looks great for a 90-year-old woman almost. Unbelievable performance by her. So we open up with the TV show with Christopher McDonald, who will always relate with the, his character from Happy Gilmore. Like, he, he will always be the dickhead from Happy Gilmore <laughs> with Adam Sandler. And she's watching this TV. It's her favorite show. And they're screaming, juice, juice, juice. And it's like, it stands for join us in creating excellence. And a funny little story about that. I used to have this bullshit job like 10 plus years ago for, um, it was like uh, just like selling a product at a gas station for like cleaning your car and stuff like that. And they had like a convention down in Dallas and me and two other people with that company got picked to go get, go down there and stuff. And that was their catchphrase was juice and they would chant this shit and after i mean immediately i was like this is like a fucking cult dude <laughs> straight up like this is a fucking like borderline cult like this is exactly what this is and i quit like a little bit after that but just a little tangent on that whenever i hear juice i think of that job and how fucking cultish that shit was. <laughs> so we, uh, we're in 1977, Brighton Beach, Coney Island, and we have Harry Goldfarb and his friend Tyrone and his girlfriend Marion, played by Jennifer Connelly, and they're all heroin addicts in the 70s. And we start in the summer, and the film's divided into three parts and three seasons. It starts in the summer, progresses to the fall, and then ends in the winter. And as the time, the seasons go by, the worse their fates get. So we have the opening scene with Harry coming to his mother, to Sarah's house, his mother, and taking the TV to hawk for money for drugs, which we know he has done a hundred, hundreds of times before. Like when we see Sarah go for go to uh, Mr. Rabinowitz to get the TV back, which is the guy from Scarface. He was like the bodyguard for like, the, I forget the, the big guy's name. It's been a while since I've seen Scarface, but he was in Scarface as the bodyguard. And Rabinowitz, the name they gave him, is actually the last name of the editor of this movie, which I actually just found out like 10 minutes ago. And I will rub that shit in and say, you didn't know that? How can you not know that? I just learned it 10 minutes ago. <laughs> but then she's, he takes the TV and I love the, there's so many creative like shot camera shots and tricks and the directing in this movie is just absolutely phenomenal i've never got big into aronofsky's films like i've seen pie his directorial debut like 20 plus years ago and haven't seen it since but i remember enjoying it enough that when this movie was announced that his second film was coming out and I remembered seeing Pi. I said, all right. I said, all right, I gotta check this one, this second film of his out. And after that, I never really, I don't think I've seen another Aronofsky film after this. I mean, Black Swan, I think I saw, and I don't remember that film at all. So I can't even comment on that. But this is his absolute masterpiece, in my opinion. It's such a crazy movie that it, it's so hard to just, say enough about this film but so he ends up harry ends up taking the tv and i love that the split screen of sarah behind the door and harry on the other side with the tv asking oh, mom open the door and stuff and he's trying to unlock the chain on the tv and he thinks it's for him which it probably is but she says it's for the robbers it's not for you and slides the key under the door and you know, Ma, come out, please, and stuff. And then starts, when she doesn't, just starts screaming, you're going to do this to your own flesh and blood, Ma, your own son, and stuff. Just absolutely great depiction of manipulation and preying on feelings of loved ones that addicts tend to do, which they don't, most of the time, don't mean to, but 
it's just par for the course. It's a disease. It's just part of the disease. You know, it's just manipulation, lies, and all that great stuff. <laughs> but they end up smashing right to the cut it, the credits. And it just says Requiem for a Dream, and we get Lux Eterna, the soundtrack, the main theme from this movie. That after this movie came out, you heard this song everywhere. Like they were playing this in trailers for other movies. Like it became such an iconic track. And that is something I need to talk about immensely is Clint Mansell and the Kronos Quartet's score for this movie. This score for this movie might be my favorite score in a film ever. It is so fucking good. And it's almost like it's the, the score and the music in this movie is like a character on its own. Like the music is its own character. There's hardly, there's very few scenes in this movie that doesn't have the score playing in it. Very few scenes. I, the only like I can think of is when um, Harry goes to Sarah, Sarah, his mom's house, apartment, and she gives her monologue, which I will get into later because it's brilliant. And maybe like a few other small scenes. The rest of the movie is the score is completely just keeps on going through it. And that just makes it feel like it's its own character. Like the music in this movie is so fucking good. It's not even funny. It's it's unbelievably great. Like it's pro it's one of the only film scores that I own and will listen to every now and then because it's just that good. It's unbelievable. Props to Clint Mansell and the Kronos Quartet because unbelievable job on the score in this movie. So Harry and his friend Tyrone both go to Hawk, uh, Sarah's TV in Coney Island. And the way that they shoot like the drug use in this movie with just the quick shots of just like needle in the cap and then the cotton drop in and then the stick in the arm and then the blood stream and then the eyes dilate and stuff awesome like such great shots and there's so many original just like creative camera work and camera shots in this film that i i was reading a few days ago actually about this that the average film has they said like 100 to 200 cuts in it and this film has over a thousand, which you can definitely understand and see that when you watch this film, because there are so many cuts in this film and it just works so well. It's, it really does. It's amazing camera work, amazing shots, amazing, like little t mini montages of stuff. It's, it's such, it's so good. It's so fucking good. Um, so after they hock the TV, Harry and, T and Ty are saying that they want to uh, start copying and start cutting their drug up, which they're all addicted to heroin, and they want to start selling it so that way, they're, that way they can, Ty wants to get out of the ghetto and stop hustling on the streets his whole life, and it's basically what all three of them want to do, you know, Mary and Harry and uh, Ty. It's just to not have to worry about money anymore and just make something of themselves. So they decide to go out and buy a decent amount of heroin and cut it and off it and just make money. And this is in the summertime and Sarah gets her TV back by going to Mr. Rabinowitz. And you see when she, he opens his like ledger it just says Sarah Goldfarb TV, Sarah Goldfarb TV, like all down the page. So you know this has been going on for years, probably. And he says to her, he says, can I ask you a question? We've known each other forever. He's like, can, why don't you just call the police, have them talk to Harry, you won't be still on the TV anymore. And her dialogue is just great. And he's just, you know, she's, he's my only son. I can't do that. And so it's... She, he's all that I have, and it's heartbreaking. Like it really is. Like this is such a depressing film. 
It really is. That's why I, I can't watch this movie too often. Like, I really can't. But it's such a masterpiece at the same time that it's a, it's a paradox. <laughs> like, it's such a masterpiece that I love watching this movie. But then when it ends, it just sticks in my mind for days afterwards. And I'm like, I don't want to see that movie for a long ass time from now. <laughs> Happens all the time. I wrote down just Jennifer Connelly, gorgeous. Because <laughs> she is. She's, I've always loved Jennifer Connelly. She is such a beautiful woman. And she plays Marion, obviously Harry's girlfriend. So Sarah Goldfarb is addicted to, and this movie is not just about drug addiction. This movie, and uh, Aronofsky and Hubert Sel Selby Jr., who wrote the novel, have both went on record saying that, that it's not just about drug addiction, it's about all addiction. And, and so we see that Sarah is addicted to food, she's addicted to television, and those are her fixes. And she ends up getting a call saying that she won by being randomly selected to be on television, which is like her dream come true for her. And she wants to wear this red dress that she wore at Harry's graduation, and it reminds her of her. She's a widower. Her husband died an undisclosed amount of time ago. They don't really get into that. But she lives by herself in the apartment. You know, Harry's old enough that he ain't there no more. He's doing his own thing. So she's lonely. She's by herself. And TV is her fix. It's what makes her happy. And she gets this call saying she's going to be on television and that they'll send an application and she doesn't have to pay anything. It's not like they're selling anything that she's already won. And this just gets her going, like gets her so excited that she want, she dyes her hair red, which comes out orange, which is a great line of saying, like, if this is if that's if this is red, then what's orange? Tell me, like, if this is red, what's orange? And she's right, and her hair came out not good. <laughs> it's not red in the slightest. It is fucking carrot orange, which they fix a little bit after they really, uh, they don't show it, but they like re dye it a little to make it a little more red. So she tries dyeing to fit into this red dress and does like grapefruit and hard boiled eggs. And just again, the camera work, like when she's looking at the diet, like the book and stuff, how it just, it's just no sugar. And it's just like salad, no dressing, and dinner, this, no sugar. And it just pans on no, 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 no. Just awesome. Like just such inventive shots and it's, it's throughout this whole movie. So, Marion and Harry want to open up a clothing store because Marion designs her own uh, clothing designs and stuff. So Harry is saying you know, he crunched the numbers and stuff and it's not impossible and they can do it together. And that's like their little dream of what they want to do with their lives. And that's why they're starting to sell dope because they want to be able to start that company, start that clothing store and you know, not have to worry anymore and like live their dream. And so after trying the dieting, um, Sarah hears from a friend that a friend of hers went to a doctor, gave her some pills, and poof, just the weight just flew off of her. So she keeps trying this little grapefruit diet for a little bit and not working. <laughs> like she can't stop looking at the fridge. She goes to bed and there's just an awesome shot of just cupcakes and cookies floating in the air above her and she can't sleep and she ends up getting on the phone and calling her friend and asking for the number of the doctor to go see him and get on these diet pills to lose weight faster and not have to go through the hell of dieting which the hardest things in life man i mean <laughs> there's no easy ways <laughs> so the way they cut like and shoot like the, the small cuts of like the heroin usage of Harry and Ty mixed with like Sarah filling her coffee up and stuff like that, like interconnected and awesome. Just again, just so many great shots and camera tricks in this film. So uh, Harry and Tyrone get their um, heroin that they end up cutting and Tyrone says to him that, you know, 
maybe we should try it just to test the purity and stuff before we so we know how much to cut and harry at first is apprehensive about it he's like if we get wasted we're just gonna fuck it all up and obviously eventually that's what happens never get high on your own supply old saying that everyone's heard so marion goes out with her psychologist or psychiatrist they don't really specify it but he's a fucking asshole this guy arnold complete dickhead and he basically she goes out with him every now and then because so her parents don't cut her off money wise so she doesn't want to be there with him and stuff but just so she doesn't get cut off from money from her parents which obviously she needs the money because she's an addict and she just keeps seeing her psychologist or doctor or whatever every now and then to keep her parents content so we have the scene of them finally out on the streets harry and ty selling their dope and again with the camera shots and everything of just pulling the bags out of trash cans and it going into a pocket and then another one and then there's naturally and it's just like the words it just the way it's all put together it's so fucking brilliant and they they come home uh, harry comes home with a shit ton of money and tells marion that we are on our way and everybody's thirsty out there great stuff so sarah goes to the doctor and this doctor does not look at her at all in this, in the two scenes that she goes to the doctor's office, doesn't make eye contact one bit. He's just staring down at his paperwork and says, "What's the problem? I hear you want to lose weight and stuff." Doesn't look her in the eye, nothing. And that's some commentary, man, because there are so many doctors like that that will just call. They just they're legal fucking drug dealers. That is exactly what they are. They are legal drug dealers. And they don't give a fuck about you or what happens to you or anything as long as they are making money. And there's, that's great commentary there. Just the, the, that little touch of having the doctor not look at her at all just speaks volumes about what type of doctor he is and stuff. So she's prescribed amphetamines, diet pills, uppers, as they were talking called back in the day and she so the weight starts melting off of her and she feels amazing and has all this energy and stuff like that and he gives her a green pill which i'm assuming is like a valium or xanax or something like that to sleep at night and the first time she takes her pills and she says like she just says one one in the morning one in the afternoon and one in the evening and she looks at the fridge she's like that's my three meals smarty pants <laughs> and she takes her pills for the first time and has so much energy that she is the conga music comes in which is just awesome <laughs> as she starts dancing around the kitchen and stuff with all just completely sped up and everything it's such a great scene and uh, drinking coffee on top of that so she's wired out of her mind she's sitting in the chair watching tv and she's just like <laughs> just freaking the fuck out <laughs> completely sped out of her mind and <laughs> Like I said, Tyrone just wants to get out of the ghetto and stop just hustling on the streets every day. And we get this little scene of memory of his, of him coming home as a kid to his mom and said, I made it, mom. And she said, you don't have to do anything, sweetie. You just have to love your mama. So he has some mother issues. They don't specify if she died or not, but he's looking at a picture of her later on in the movie. So I'm assuming she passed away. But I'm not sure. I haven't read the book in years. I did read the book like years ago, but I haven't read it in, in a long time. So I don't know if they specified that in the book. But um, it seems like she died and passed away. The shot of Sarah cleaning the apartment when she's all sped up on a speed. And they start in the bedroom and then it just seamlessly it just pans through the apartment slowly as it's all sped up and she's cleaning the apartment and then into the kitchen what a great shot like they had to i remember they built the set and stuff and they took all the siding off of it and they had just a steady cam that just went straight through and filmed it and it took like an insane amount of hours to get that whole shot down like and it shows it's an absolutely phenomenal shot love that scene 
So Harry ends up buying a new TV for his mother because he feels bad about all the years and wear and tear of Tom constantly taking it and selling it and then her getting it back and him doing it all over again. And he feels terrible about it. So he ends up buying a TV for his mother from Macy's and it'll be delivered in a few days. And he goes over to see his mother and he hears her grinding her teeth and she has all this energy and he obviously is an addict you know he knows the signs he looks at this and my you're on uppers like you're on uppers you're in diet pills and she's like i'm going to a specialist and everything he's telling her it's no good you got to cut that crap out i'm telling you and she has this great line when she says just like how do you know so much more about medicine than a doctor and he says trust me mom i know and it's true, man, with a lot of addicts, they know more about drugs and medicine than most doctors do. And it's, I mean, that's scary in its own right. <laughs> like most of these doctors, they, like I said, it's just a paycheck to them. They don't give a fuck about you or your problems or your issues or anything like that. Unless you find just like a really good doctor who just loves what they do just to help people and stuff like that. But those are the exceptions and not the rule by far sarah's monologue at bernstein's uh, bernstein's monologue in that scene when she starts saying how she feels and stuff like that and uh, why she wants to fit into the red dress and remember how uh, your father harry used to treat us so well and everything and start saying that she you know i clean the dishes and make the bed and every morning but why should i and uh, i'm lonely and i'm old and like I read once a while back that the cameraman who shot that scene actually started crying because of her performance, because of how intense and just amazing she was giving that monologue. And it is phenomenal. Like, God, I cannot say enough about Burson's acting in this. It's unreal. It's probably my one of my favorite roles by an actress in a movie ever it's just absolutely iconic and every scene with her every line out of her mouth everything is just unbelievable she's so good in this so we got cut to ty and he's in a limousine with uh, his drug dealer and stuff and he wants to promote ty and says he's being a junkie i never understood that line he says and you're not a junkie but it clearly is like so i don't get that and the window of the limousine comes down and ty says shit you got a white driver <laughs> and the, the guy just turns around and starts mowing down people in, in the limousine and ty gets blood on his face he runs out of the limousine and he starts running for his life the cops come they arrest him and he ends up getting bailed out after that by uh, Harry and they says that he took most of their cash he's up for consortant and that there's this huge war be drug war between the Italians and the blacks and that they, it's nothing on the street no drug and heroin on the street until all the people like Brody the uh, drug dealer for a uh, tie are all knocked off and killed so this is where they start really going downhill because they can't get their drugs and they start slipping into withdrawals and at the same time sarah starts getting adjusted to her pills and ends up even calling the doctor and saying like i don't feel the same like maybe you gave me your week of one last time and she said you're just getting adjusted to them it's normal and what does she do she ends up taking a pill and then looks at it and just pops a second one and then you see her back to her little energetic self and happy in her chair watching tv and i mean that's what happens man people some people and who have addictive ten addictive tendencies like that even with prescribed medication they'll be taking it they get used to it they don't feel the same way that they did and then they double up or triple up and just keep on going and because the tolerance just keeps on building and sarah starts slipping into amphetamine psychosis and slow motion shot of her back at the doctor's office 
where it's just everything is in slow motion and she's looking around confused and she's like talking to the doctor who again is not looking at her at all and saying the weights your weight seems fine and she's like the weight's fine i'm not everything's all mixed up and stuff you know i wouldn't worry about that just fill this and make an appointment for a week from now fucking disgusting dude it really is so disgusting the way that these, this doctor treats this poor woman. And again, I won't keep saying it, but in real life, the same way a lot of the time. And Marion's scene with Harry when they're fighting about... What the hell did I even write here? Oh, when they're fighting about having nothing like for the morning and stuff like that. Like they're sleeping... And they're going to withdrawals and marrying this, like, you see her just laying this way and then curling up and laying upside down on the bed and stuff. And then Harry wakes up and says, you want some water? He goes into the room and that's when we first see his arm. And he has, like, an abscess or something on his arm. And it's not too bad at that point, but... He ends up and uh, Marion says, you know, why don't we dip into our stuff? And he's like, hey, we don't have a lot and stuff. Or wait, and she ends up using her manipulation, saying, you know, Tyrone's going to score in the morning. And you know it, it's going to be okay, Harry. And he says, I guess. And they both end up dipping in and getting high. And then the next morning, Marion says to Harry, after uh, Harry gets a call from Ty saying he hasn't found nothing yet, saying that you were all hot and heavy, Harry, to get, you know, to push off last night. And totally untrue. Fucking, we just saw the scene before. It was all Marion. It was all her idea. And Harry even says, like, what well, do you expect me to watch you push off and not go myself? And she's like, just don't put it all on me. We could have had some from the morning. Just it, ultra realistic, dude. I mean, just the, the way that they show how addiction specifically drug addiction in this dynamic between this couple is so realistic like it's scary like just showing how this shit will just tear anyone apart from each other and that the drug the addiction is all that really matters absolutely terrifying shit to look at <laughs> And we have a scene of Sarah putting her lipstick on and dancing around in a red dress. Great shot, great scene. I love that she's dancing around. So Harry and Ty end up meeting at Wall Bombs because they hear that there's gonna be a truck coming from Florida. And it's like almost winter at this point. And they don't want um, this like one drug deal or whatever, doesn't want um, you know, people fiending and not having their heroin and stuff during the glorious Christmas season. <laughs> he says being a good Christian and all. So there's, they meet at war bombs and this, that's where this is supposed to all go down. And there are a ton of junkies there all waiting to cop. And Aronofsky actually said in an interview that, there are, that he casted actual drug addicts and junkies to be in that scene. And he recalled a whole bunch of them shooting up on set or shooting up in the bathrooms and stuff like that. Absolutely crazy. I mean, good for realism and for making the movie, but imagine being a director trying to make a movie and you have dozens of drug addicts like shooting up all over your movie set and in the bathrooms and stuff like that. I mean, to deal with that, that's going to have to be fucking hard to deal with. <laughs> and we see while they're there, we see Marion tearing her, the apartment apart, looking for any like leftover drugs or anything that she can take. You see her at one point like drinking like cough syrup or something like that, just to like calm the withdrawals and stuff. And she's ripping her designs apart and just going insane, just waiting for them to come back from copying this. And they have to cop for weight and it's double the price. So in order to get the money, Harry asks uh, Marion to go visit Arnold, the dickhead doctor, psychologist of hers, and ask him for money because her parents aren't returning her calls for a while now and stuff. So she meets up with Arnold, but she says before she goes, she says, I don't know what I'm going to have to do to get the money. 
and Harry just says, everything will be all right. It'll be just like the summer, I promise you, and blah, blah, blah. And she ends up going on dinner, going to dinner or something with the psychologist. And he says, you know, like, is there a problem and stuff? That's usually the issue when you don't hear from somebody for a long time, and then you do. And she says, everything's fine, but actually I need some money. And then you cut to a scene of her standing there with this guy behind, with a doctor behind her on bed, stroking himself. And she's saying to herself, can you, saying to him, can you shut the light? And he says, you never wanted it off before. Fucked up, man. <laughs> That's fucked up. What a fucking revelation that was the first time I saw that movie. It's like, wow, she's fucked this guy many, many times before. And apparently while she's been with Harry, fucked up, dude. Like that. That's like, it's terrible. Finding out like your girlfriend's cheating on you and so like, what a terrible fucking revelation that is. And you even see Harry in the apartment waiting for her to get back and he's watching the TV and the TV turns into, it was static on the TV and the static turns into like a, a hallucination of Marion getting fucked by some guy and he immediately shoots up and then it goes, turns back to static and stuff. The way they portray like the numbness, like how these people numb their emotions and feelings with their drugs, top notch the way that they portray this. Like it, um, when after uh, Harry was at um, his mother's house and noticed he was, she was on diet pills and everything and he gets in the cab and stuff after that, he is, starts breaking down, crying and everything, knowing that his mother's on these pills and stuff and that she can get strung out. And then he shoots up in the back of the cab and then it's just blank, just numb, no emotion, no crying left. It's just completely numb by it. They do a phenomenal job of portraying that. And so they have the scene with um, Marion freaks out on Harry when he gets back from wall bombs because they were going to cop there. Some junkie pulls out a gun and shoots in the air and they immediately, the truck from Florida that's there to sell to everybody just shuts the briefcases, shuts the truck, the truck drives away and the bodyguard starts shooting automatic weapons into the crowd and stuff. You don't see one person get hit. <laughs> like there's not, he, there's two, like two guards that are shooting automatic rifles or like submachine guns into the crowd and not a single person goes down. Not a single person you see gets hit with a bullet. Get the fuck out of here. <laughs> so ridiculous. The way he's going, <laughs> like swaying the gun back and forth, he would have fucking hit like 25 of these people in like immediately. Such a ridiculous scene. <laughs> and then we go to him getting home to the apartment and Marion's been waiting and, like I said, tearing the apartment up and everything, saying, and he, she, he gets home and she says, where's the stuff? And he said, well, we had a bit of a problem and some fucking junkie and she screams at him, I was, did what? You know, some junkie did what? You mean you fucked up? Just, oh, the fucking acting in this movie by all of them it is just so good and the the way that they're arguing like that and that she's screaming at him calling him, you fucking loser i fucked that sleaze bag for you whenever you said everything's gonna be everything's gonna be okay and just oh man it's so good it's such great acting such an intense scene and like i said the music that just continues on through the whole movie and it, it, this movie, in my opinion, it would still be a great movie without the score, but the score elevates this film to a masterpiece. Like, without the score, this movie would not be as good as it is. And that's saying something, because the movie is great, like, on its own. But the score absolutely elevates this film to just masterful levels. So now we are in winter and after they, uh, Marion freaks out on Harry. He says what Tyrone told him that 
there's a guy, Big Tim, who is the only person in in Brooklyn and Coney Island where they're at that has anything, but he ain't selling it. He's just giving it up for pussy for women. And he ends up asking Tyrone for the name and the number. And he gives him the number and he ends up giving it to Marion and says, if you want to go fix yourself up with him, go ahead. And that way you don't have to wait around. I don't have to be freezing my ass on the street. And then we have the iconic scene with Sarah in her apartment. And she's almost in full blown amphetamine psychosis at this point. And you can see they show a shot of like, the table next to her chair where she sits to watch TV and her pill bottles are spilt over and all the different pills are all over the counter and stuff. So, and she sits down, she's just taking pill after pill after pill, like just completely almost gone. And the conga music starts up again. <laughs> and on the TV, she starts hallucinating like crazy. She starts seeing the fridge start like banging and moving towards her and banging and moving towards her again. And uh, then the, the Christopher McDonald's character from the TV show is with a, you know, beautiful Alan Burson made up all like how she wants to look when she went on television in her red dress and everything with her hair nice and red and everything and she hallucinates the tv crew like taking down her entire apartment and it like turning it into the television like set and just an amazing scene and they just keep chanting feed me sarah feed me sarah and like the fake sarah from tv is making out with christopher mcdonald and she has such sad and sweet lines in this scene she's like they're laughing at her apartment and she's like i live alone you know i'm old and she's like it, it, it's an old building you know that hasn't been painted in years and she's like listen let me explain like give me let's give me a chance and i'll explain everything heartbreaking man i watch that scene it breaks my fucking heart seeing her like that unbelievable acting so harry and tyrone decide why don't we drive down to florida from new york and cop down there and at first, Ty's like, you're fucking crazy. What are you talking about? And Harry says to him, he's like, you're saying you can't nose out some dope if it's around. We can go down there, pick up, come back to New York and have everybody scuffle the streets for them. And again, they the said, we'll fill up our box again. It'll be just like last summer. So they end up getting a car through the, um, one of the drug dealers, friends of Ty's, um, Angel, I think his name is. And they promise him some like real good heroin and stuff if they share a car for them to rent to take down to Florida. So they fly down, uh, fly down. They end up driving down to Florida. And there's this weird part where this weird little part of the scene where Ty is in the passenger seat and Harry's driving and his abscess, his arm is getting worse. And it's on his left arm and Ty says something and he, he does, gives him like a little punch kind of a little like tap to harry's right arm and he like oh like in pain but it's not on his right arm his right arm's not it's the left arm that's fucked up so i don't know if that was a goof i'm pretty sure it was but i mean he could have like hit him in the right arm and that pushed his left arm into the door and that's what made him feel the pain it's possible, but I'm pretty sure that was just a, a complete mess up on their part because it, it it does not look like he pushes him hard enough that his left arm would go into the door. Like, it, it doesn't look that way at all. And Sarah ends up running out of the apartment after all those hallucinations and stuff, takes a train to the TV sto studio and starts asking, and she's, like, almost completely gone at this point. She's, like, snot coming out of her nose, and her hair is just, like, gray and red and just, like looks completely disheveled like a homeless person a crazy person she's when she's even on the train she's does this uh, train go to madison avenue like i'm gonna be on television and the guy's like you're whacked <laughs> a great line it's so fucking it's, it's so sad though seeing that and she ends up at the tv studio and she's just saying and again such great dialogue and amazing acting by her and 
they're all all the employees here at this TV studio are like surrounding her and just the looks on their faces of like despair and like such sadness for this woman and what they're looking at what they're seeing her acting like and like how she is and her mental state and everything what a heartbreaking scene man and the they the one of the women tells her you know it takes a while to get cold for a tv show mrs goldfarb and she's just sipping on tea that they gave her and she's like just shaking and stuff and she says i'm not worried about the prizes i'll give them all away i just want to be on the show i just want to be on the show so amazing such great lines and then the cops show up because they obviously called the police because this crazy woman is in the studio fucking freaking out and acting like a lunatic so they come and immediately take her to a psych ward and start trying to give her medications and everything like that which she does not respond to any of them and i love how in this movie how as the movie progresses you have long scenes as it starts in the middle of the movie and the further it gets to the end the shorter the scenes and it keeps cutting back to each one of the characters just amazing just such great editing such great directing just so fucking good on every level and she goes to the psych ward and marion ends up calling big tim played by keith david the classic Keith David, I love him. He's obviously in The Thing and um, so many other things. I can't even think right now, <laughs> but he's so many things he's been in. I love Keith David. And Ty ends up, they pull over to, to push off and get high. And Tyrone sees Harry's arm, which is just, oh, it's so disgusting. It's, it's so disgusting looking. It's just a, a purple fucking gangrenous on his arm and like where he shoots up it's like it's like a hole in his skin oh god it's so fucking brutal looking oh it's disgusting i want to throw up every time i see that arm and and he shoots up anyway in the arm he said i don't want to blow the vein and stuff like that and even tyrone's like what well, what's wrong you don't shoot in there and like you should have listened to him man because and i'm sure it wouldn't have mattered because his arm is fucked as it is at that point and marion ends up meeting with big tim and ends up fucking him for drugs and she gets her drugs at the end and he starts saying there's going to be a party on Sunday, all good people, you know, and it's a nice taste and she's sniffling, still in withdrawal, saying like, oh, it's all right, I'm busy, I'm not really hooked and come on, that's what they all say and Big Tim just says, oh, I know, it's a great taste though and tosses the drugstore and he, he, and he knows, he, of course, he's a drug dealer, he knows that, all the signs, he knows she's hooked and stuff. He knows that she's going to come. So he basically says, you know, see you on Sunday, Maid Mary. And he calls it Maid Mary, which I think is a nice little touch. <laughs> and Harrison and Ty go to the doctor finally. Uh, Harrison, Harry and Ty. Go, and I was thinking of Dexter for a second, which I could not stand the new season. Uh, I like the new season, but I couldn't stand... Um, Harrison's character. What a whiny little fucker. Like, I really, it didn't do it for me. But that's for, I might review Dexter in the future. I love that show. So, but that's for then. So they end up going to the doctor for, to see, you know, to treat Harry's arm. And <laughs> his arm's much worse at this point. And the doctor comes in, he says there's something wrong with his arm. He turns it over and it's just disgusting, dude. It's just spreading and just his whole part of his arm here is fucking purple. And it's, oh God. And the doctor sees this and he's like, all right, I'll be right back. And right before he leaves, he just like grabs on the table, like, like three vials of morphine or like whatever it is, because he knows he's a drug addict. So, yeah, I thought that was so funny the first time I saw that. All right, I'll be right back. And he just snatches the fucking morphine and just <laughs> walks away and ends up calling the cops. And it seems like they're in 
well, obviously they're in somewhere between New York and Florida, so like further south and stuff. And this is in '77, so in the waiting room, Tyrone is getting eyed by everybody for just for being a black man in this area, which is fucked up. But <laughs> that, you know, that's how it was back then, unfortunately. And we see that's uh, the cops come and they arrest the both of them and they take them to jail. Just for being drug addicts. This was back in the day when even just being an addict, you can get arrested for. And they never show or specify if they went through their car and found any of the little bit of the dope that they had left, like for the trip to keep them out of withdrawals or semi out of withdrawals. But I'm assuming they probably did. And uh, Sarah is not responding, like I said, to the medication. Marion starts getting ready for this sex orgy party that she's going to end up getting drugs out of it for. And then we have this scene with the phone call between Harry and Marion. What a fucking depressing, heartbreaking scene, man. Like, it, it, it almost brings a tear to my eye when I see this scene in this movie. And Marion's making herself up look all prune with makeup and stuff for this sex orgy that she knows she's going to. And Harry's in jail with Tyrone, and he, this is one phone call, and he calls Marion saying, you're hanging in there, and I'm coming back soon. And she says, can you come today? And he just breaks down and says, yeah, I'll come today. And he's crying, you just wait for me. And she's all right, and she knows he's not coming back. And what a heartbreaking scene, man. It's it's hard to watch, it really is. And we end up saying the doctor, um, since he, she, uh, Sarah in the hospital isn't responding to medication, he said we had good track record with uh, electroconvulsive therapy, ECT, in the past, and they he ends up wanting to try that on her to see if that will snap her out of this psychosis that she's in. And we have the scene that with Harry and um, Tyrone in the jail cell. And what a great effect and shot. He's Harry's laying in bed and Tyrone is on the bars with his hand on the jail cell bars. And he's like, help us please. And he's saying, somebody help us. My friend's sick. And uh, Leto's character, Harry's laying there and he's screaming, my arm, my foot. Fucking are and the the camera is shaking violently, and, and, and Tyrone's just somebody fucking help us please like a, a, fucking intense dude it really is what an intense scene and then we just, I, I even just put down last twenty minutes because I know this movie in the back of my head. the last twenty minutes of this film is some of the most intense horrific depressing, just repugnant shit like I've ever seen in a movie. Like, unreal. And the way that they just, like I said, how the scenes just, and the shots just keep getting shorter and shorter and shorter. And they just keep flashing between all four characters and their fates and what's going on. And, you know, Harry and Tyrone in the jail. And they're saying, you know, they're going through, like, for work duty. And um, Ty doesn't say, yes, sir. And they knock him in the chest and hit him and say... So he says, yes, sir. Then they get to Harry and says something's wrong with his arm. They turn it over and it's, oh, it's so fucking nasty. And they end up taking him to the hospital. Then they have Marion come into this orgy and stuff. And they have her and what a brave role for Connolly to take. And so, I mean, I, who knows how much of this was her in this scene, but... She had a scene earlier in the movie where she's standing naked in front of the mirror and her bush is showing and stuff like, and that's her. Like you can tell that's her. Like there's no way that isn't her Jennifer Connelly in front of the mirror. So who knows how much of that sex orgy scene she did? But just what? It's so fucked up, man. The way, the places people will go just for drugs, just for the addiction, just to ease the pain and not go into withdrawals and. It's, 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 it's such a sick disease, man. It really is. And it's just flashing between the ECT on, going on on Sarah and shocking her and the music, the fucking music. 
I can't say enough about the music. It's just unreal and makes this whole final se sequence at the end just that much more disturbing. And in the end, we just end up Harry's taking the hospital and they amputate his arm from like above the elbow, like from here down. And he has just the stump here. And the doctor or nurse or whatever says, uh, he, he says, Marion, she says, she'll be sent for her, she'll come. And he's like, no, she won't. And he knows that she won't. And then we see Marion come home from the sex party after this huge orgy with people watching and throwing money at them. And then we have that <laughs> this old man with that famous line of, what should we do next? Ass to ass. <laughs> ass to ass. Like, it's so sick. Such a sick line and just so weird. And just the way how creepy this old dude is saying it. So crazy. And then we see Ty we keep cutting all between all four characters and stuff like that. And we see Tyrone like uh, mashing potatoes and stuff like that. Making mashed potatoes for work duty. And you have a cameo from Hubert Selby Jr., the author of the book. Which I didn't know until the last time I saw this movie, which was maybe a year and a half ago or something like that. Like I said, I can't watch this movie too often. And he plays the cop or the guard in the jail who scream, put your spineless back into it. And uh, you know, it's the problem with you New York Dolphins. You got a rotten attitude. Like, that's him. And this, that was great to see him in a little cameo like that because he always wanted to adapt his book into a film and that's how he met up with Aronofsky and got this whole movie like made and everything but um yeah and they end up uh, Sarah is basically almost canatonic like from the ECT and everything or two friends go to visit her and they and they're crying outside just looking at her friend and how much he's fallen and how the shape that she's in and Marion comes home from the orgy and lays on the couch and hugs her her drugs and they all turn in the fetal position Sarah she's watching the tv and turns in the fetal position and Tyrone is going through withdrawals in jail and turns into the fetal position same with with Harry in the bed after his arms amputated, and the same with Marion on the couch when she's hugging her drugs, all turn and sit and lay in the fetal position. And we see Sarah looking up at the TV with some some few synapses working, I guess, because she smiles while she's looking at her TV show with Christopher McDonald and has a hallucination of her looking all beautiful with the red dress and the red hair. And having her son Harry come out and he has his arm and stuff like that and he looks all good and made up and handsome and stuff and just oh and just hug each other on the tv and, she, and uh Sarah's just like I love you son and she's like I love you too ma and they hug and fucking Lux Eterna theme comes back on and credits and what a fucking movie. If people can't see how this movie can be considered a horror movie, like I said earlier, I don't know what to say. Like, fuck off. <laughs> Pretty much. That's how you build a channel, Justin. That's what you do. You just tell any people who are viewing this, Jesus, 57 minutes of this review just to fuck off. That's how you build a channel. You just tell all your viewers to fuck right off. <laughs> <laughs> but I, this, again, as I keep doing, went on for much longer than I thought. And I'm just going to keep saying this in every review, basically, because for some reason, everyone outdoes the last one in time. So I got to stop going on little tangents and shit like that <laughs> because it's making shit way longer than I intend to. Um, I will have another review up in a few hours. I will be doing Devil's Rejects. And The Brood by David Cronenberg. And maybe another one. I'm trying to... I got all night. So I'm, I got a lot of free time until tomorrow. So I'm going to try to knock out as much as I can. But if anyone made it to the end of this, thanks for watching. And I will see you all shortly. And I hope you all had a good Memorial Day. Take care.